Good afternoon, lovely people. How are you all doing today? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're warm and cosy somewhere. Oh my goodness, what a week. Well, I don't think I can ignore the, the weather this week because it does change things. Um, we had this freeze and as I mentioned when I was harvesting, I don't know why that I didn't know it was coming, but I didn't. Anyway, so it's a bit of a surprise. And now I know that for folk in all sorts of other parts of the world, the weather we've had this week is nothing to you guys. It just batter off its normal. The reason that me or other channels you watch from London and other parts have talked about it is because it's not usual for us. Uh, we rarely get snow, so to have three days of snow, bonkers. But more than that, it rarely... We do fall below zero here, I'm talking in centigrade. We do fall below zero at night time. In the day, with, with people, businesses, buildings, traffic, the sun coming up, what have you, we always come above zero. So to have a, a whole week where the daytime temperatures stayed below zero was bonkers. But it was the wind, the wind was the killer. Um, we had this wind and it was sort of sweeping down from sort of Norway, Sweden, and then boom, bashing into us here in London. So it was making the temperature, the feels like temperature uh, was minus 10. Minus 10 during the day here, bonkers. Uh, the fact is we just, we're not equipped for it. Why would we be? Because it's not, it's not normal for us. That's like, you know, why would someone in the Sahara have a load of water butts? <laughs> they don't get rain. Well, actually, that's all the more reason to have water butts, isn't it? So if there is a bit of rain, you catch it. You, you know what I mean. Um, yes, yeah, so we don't have the outdoor clothing for it. I know, for example, if we just go a few hundred miles north where my sister lives, Firstly, they get snow more often than me. They're up on the North Yorkshire Moors. It's gorgeous, oh my goodness, such a beautiful part of the world. Um, so yes, they get a bit more snow than us. Well, they get snow most winters, but also because they live up there with all this beautiful countryside on their doorstep, they're, they're real outdoorsy people. They're out there all the time. So they've got the proper kind of jackets and trousers and boots and they've got all that gear because they're out most weekends, most weathers. Whereas me here in London, you know, just walking down the street to the garden. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been an interesting week, but I think, oh, just to say very quickly as well, I know a few folk mentioned, why don't I use walking poles? I did try them once, it was just after I'd had surgery and I was up at my sister's, was that my sister's? I think it must have been. I just didn't get on with them. Now that may be because I'd literally just come off crutches and I felt really safe on the crutches. So to suddenly go to the poles, I didn't feel quite so stable. But also down here, well firstly, why would I buy a piece of kit that I'm gonna use for say one day every two or three years? because really these events are so few and far between. But also, because I'm always carrying something, whether I'm pulling my granny trolley behind me or you know carrying shopping bags and what have you. And someone else had said to me about, you know, do it all in a backpack. Uh, I used to, I used to do all my to and froing from the garden with my 50 litre rucksack. Can you imagine how heavy that used to be with the potato harvest in it and half my squash harvest in it, bring it home. And the problem with that, all that weight is, it's not an issue in terms of my strength, um, but it's just that that's all that additional weight is going down through my knees. And it was just hurting too much. So it's much easier to pull the granny trolley, uh, but of course that means that's one of my hands taken up. Anyway, um, it's all pretty much melted, there's still a little bit left in the garden. I'm not in a hurry to get 
back there just yet. We now do a week of rain. Oh my goodness. I really want to get on with things in the garden. Uh, but I'm going to let the next few days go by because hopefully that warmer weather will perk up all those plants that were in the frost. Um, yeah, so it's been a bit of an odd week in a way because, <clears throat> you know, the, the, I felt a bit, I don't know what the right word, I was going to say I felt a bit down this week. I'm not sure whether that's the right word. Um, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I, I'll, I always perk up. I always give myself a kick in the pants. But yeah, just this slight feeling of, actually, you know what, rather than down, just a bit fed up. And I think it's a combination of I'm missing being in the garden because really, so far this year, the weather has not played ball. You know, when we have had dry days, I've been busy doing something else or someone else or whatever. Um, so I think it's a combination of I'm missing the garden and I think I think the whole lockdown thing I think it's just maybe beginning to wear on me a bit um, you know for instance I do have my social bubble with Richard and Paul which is fantastic but we don't do it on public transport because we're all being really careful none of us want to use public transport we don't want to crowd the buses out the buses should be left as empty as possible for people who have to take the bus to work. Um, so it means hiring a car, and either, either they come over here for the day or they come and pick me up and I go over to theirs and you know then stay a couple of days, make it worthwhile. But it just means it's, you know, it's, it's not often, it's maybe once a month. It's a bit of a palaver with the car and everything. Yeah, I think I'm just missing that thing of, I just want to jump on a bus or a train, either pop over to see the lads or to my great aunt. Um, you know, it's been, we're coming up for 12 months since I've been down there. I'm in contact all the time. Uh, I've literally just this morning had another couple of texts, a couple of issues I need to sort out. And this is the other thing, you know, I miss her, of course I miss seeing her, but I also miss my little routine of going down there, sorting stuff in the house, bit of cooking, bit of cleaning, bit of maintenance, bit of, oh my goodness, I can't bear to think what it's like, but a bit of in the garden, uh, it's just, it's overrun with brambles, and about five years ago, I hacked them all back. I mean, they'd encroached right up to the windows. They were scratching on the windows. But I'm now thinking it's gonna be like Sleeping Beauty with all these thorns and brambles. I'm gonna to have to hack my way through to find my gorgeous great aunt again. So yeah, I miss, I miss doing stuff for her as well as actually seeing her. Ah, you know what? It is what it is, and I think it's I think it's okay to to have these feelings and just acknowledge them and say, yeah, maybe I am feeling a bit fed up, maybe I am feeling a bit uh, cabin fever. I do think once the weather improves and I can get to the garden, I will feel much better. Apart from anything, I think it's just that kind of oh boredomness in my belly, that sort of being more physical. I'm certainly busy indoors. I don't sit still, but it's not the same as being out there. So talking of being busy and the garden, I just got to show you these because in a few hours they'll be on sale and they'll all have gone. This is, I wonder if I can do this without the hook. <laughs> you see, oh, it's all my seeds. Yeah, it's all my seeds, Freddie ready and waiting to go on sale. They will be on sale later today. Oh, actually, let me put those right down on the floor. Um, so, yes, it's all in my little um, handmade seed packets. I tell you what, it don't look it, but it's an absolute mountain of work. It's taken me ages 
So a thank you to those who are waiting for them for your patience. <coughs> I should just say, uh, and I'm, I've got no control over this, so apologies, but I can only ship them within England, Wales and Scotland. I can't even send them to Northern Ireland anymore. So I'm really, really sorry to, to other folk. Now listen, I understand this thing of countries not wanting seeds coming in and out. You know, it's biological, biological hygiene, isn't it, at borders. So I completely understand it. Um, it's, just, it's just a shame, isn't it? And it's especially a shame this year that I can't get to Northern Ireland and hopefully, I'm not gonna go there, Ho as in politically, hopefully, that can be sorted um, soon because it is a bit of a pickle, isn't it? Anyway, yeah, so that's been keeping me busy. Oh, and just, oh, I don't know if there's any, oh, yeah, I won't talk about that because, yeah, never mind, ignore that. Um, yeah, so keeping myself busy indoors as always. Now that all the seeds and everything are out of the way, I'm going to get back on the sewing machine. I've done a couple of sewing jobs in the last, well, sort of, since the new year, but um, curtains, oh, can't st I can't stand curtains, they're boring. I uh, stupidly, massively undercharged. Someone asked me how much I would charge to take a pair of curtains up, to take the hems up, and I quoted a stupid figure, like, I don't know, tenner, whatever. Um, anyway, they dropped the curtains off with me. The curtains were massive, absolutely massive, like deep. They needed a lot taking off, so, but also they were fully lined, so all the lining had to come off and that had to be shortened and rehang. So yeah, there have been a couple of small, well, small, a pair of curtains, that kind of um, sewing jobs going on just to keep bringing a few pennies in, not much. Oh, and on that subject, uh, it was suggested following on from my 15 pence winter meals video, uh, a couple of folk who are really interested to know what my subsistence budget is, the nitty gritty, what I, what I have to fork out for, you know, the house and the things I do have to fork out for, what do I have coming in. So I am going to do that video uh, in a couple of days or so go through it in really fine detail, <clears throat> just so it's all clear. Because interestingly, one of those comments, who was it, was it Noddy? I can't remember, in, in my mind's eye I'm seeing Noddy, had said that he assumed I was on some kind of pension, or I'd got some sort of private income or bursary or something coming in. Hadn't realized that actually, no, <laughs> this is real, I don't have an income. Um, so it'd be really great to, to be able to share that, clarify things, and then for anyone else who's thinking of making that jump into the subsistence life, hopefully I can paint a, a, a really clear picture of it so you can think if you really want to give it a go or not. Because it is hard work and it's seven days a week and there's no sick pain, there's no holiday, but it's great. And talking of the self, <coughs> Sorry, self-sufficient light. I've got a tickle suddenly. Self-sufficient life. Um, do you remember, I think it was when I was doing my thoughts on, I said I was still getting my Christmas post and I'd had some gorgeous photos from Otis. I have to remember Otis is his username. And I hadn't shown them because I didn't have permission, but Otis then said, yeah, of course you can show them. I want to show you a picture of Otis's pantry. Bear in mind, Otis took the plunge about this time last year to basically scrap having a garden and turn it all into a vegetable garden. Uh, bought himself a load of canning supplies, as you would say in the US, he's in the US, and fitted out this pantry. I'm gonna show you this picture. When I saw this picture, I thought it was a shop. It looks like the kind of most perfect shop that I would go to. I know it's not because he sent me a load of pictures showing the whole process from bare, empty room, building shelves, getting in all the canning supplies and then filling it. Just 
feast your eyes on this. I mean, isn't that phenomenal? So in the top, you can see he's got all his dried herbs hanging. There's a nice table in the middle with his squash piled on. And this is all the produce he's canned, bottled. And then over here, this is a really, really great idea for anyone that going the frugal route. This is bulk buying produce loose. So things like flour, rice, oats, etc., etc. If you bulk buy them loose or just bulk buy them, it's way more economical than buying small packs of things. So if you can afford that initial outlay to buy, you know, I buy a bag of rice, it's a quid. If I spent 10 quid, I could get a massive bag that's probably 20 times the size of the smaller one. Two things for me though. One, I generally don't have money up front for bulk buying and two, I don't have the space to store. I do not have a gorgeous, I mean, look, don't you want to go in there and go shopping? Or don't you want to go to, over to Otis's place for your supper? <laughs> we were all waiting for the invite, but I'm also going to show you this one because it's dead cute. His little fur, fur companions are, whoops, are guarding. Look, can you make them out? Priscilla. The puss and Max the lab, guarding the supplies. Otis, I'm just, I'm, I'm gobsmacked about what you've been able to achieve. I'm so proud of you for what you've been able to achieve. But I'm also flipping jealous of this. I'm jealous that you've got a walk-in pantry and I'm, ah, oh, jealous in the nicest way. Isn't that amazing? You know what, if you want to do something, if you put your mind to it and put your back into it, you can do it. Oh, I've got a couple of thank yous to say now as well. Can I show? Hang on a second. <laughs> oh my goodness. Aren't they gorgeous? And a sack of my, I love my hand knitted socks. These are lovely because you see sort of around that, I don't know what you call that part of the, of the sock. But it's like a sort of, it's double thickness. Oh, isn't that? The colours are, my favourite colours, I love pinks and sort of lime greens, turquoises together. So this is sort of more of an orange, but it's sort of orangey pink. I love them. I love hand knitted socks. I would go hand knitted socks over anything the shops can produce. The only thing is I can't knit. So these came from Susan who sent a really lovely card as well. You know what, that's kind of, if we were all in animal form, that's how I see us. All of us gathered together in the woods together. Lovely, lovely card, Susan, lovely note with it and thank you. I do like a little chatty note, but thank you so much. Uh, I mean, she's knitted these, it's so clever. I haven't got a clue with knitting, so brilliant. And they're so lovely and snuggly and warm. Yay! And I also had um, a really, this is so cute. Oh my goodness. This like properly taps into one of my obsessions in life. I love tins and boxes. Look at this, isn't it cute? It's a little tin. It's like a sort of suitcase with a map of the world. Isn't that cute? And that came with a, a, a gift voucher in it from Julie. Thank you so much. I love this little tin. And I don't think you can tell, yeah, you can see how deep it is, can't you? It occurs to me that this is the perfect kind of tin to keep all my sewing machine bobbins in. I have got them in a tin at the moment, but it's sort of a bit deep and a bit big and they slosh around in there. That will be perfect for what one, two, three. One, that I think that will fit fifteen bobbins, and I've probably got only ten bobbins anyway. How? It's just so cute, isn't it? <sighs> Thank you, Julie. I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, what is it about tins and boxes? I think it's probably. I think it's probably something to do with my kind of neat freaky thing. I do like to kind of have things tidy and contained. I'm a rubbish housekeeper. 
in terms of, you know, doing my cleaning and keeping on top of the dusting and all that kind of stuff. So I might be a bit dusty and muddy and grubby, but I'm, I am dead neat and organised. Partly I have to be because I live in a small place, but even when I've lived in bigger places, I do, I do like a, a tin to put things in, boxes, boxes of, oh gosh, I had them out the other day, boxes of old love letters. You're not going to see those. Um, yeah, tins of, you know, rolls of thread, tins with, long skinny tins with my paint brushes, my art paint brushes rather than my house paint brushes. My house paint brushes are in a box, a bigger box. I'm sure there are some of you who have a tin and a box obsession too. Tins in the shed. Now you see tins in the shed is, I'm trying to convince myself it's purely practical. Tins for the seeds so the mice can't get in because they can't chew through the metal. Tins for the bird seed because again the mice can't chew through. Who am I kidding? They're cute, I love them. I had to stop for a minute because I realised that there was something over there that I wanted to talk about. So, oh my goodness, looking at the clock, oh, I've done it again. I'm gonna quickly talk about the most recent books I've been reading. Uh, it is definitely that time of year, isn't it, when... Now this is a curious thing as well, and it kind of ties in with that kind of fed upness thing. I find that in the late spring, um, all through summer, all through autumn, I will quite often do an 18 hour day. Easily, happily. Um, in, this, in, in, in the lighter months I get up earlier, I do get up earlier, much as it bleh, gives me the heebie-jeebies to do it, but I'll be up at six, by seven I'm working, and quite often I'll work until midnight, one in the morning. But in winter, oh my goodness, I can barely drag myself out of bed before eight. I do, but it's torture. By three, four in the afternoon, I'm ready to go back to bed. And it's not like in the summer where, quite often in the summer, I'll have a 20, 30 minute siesta at about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Literally just 20, 30 minutes, it freshens me up, I'm ready to go, and then I'll go for another six, seven, eight hours quite happily. In the winter, by three or four o'clock in the afternoon, never mind a siesta, I want to go to bed and stay there for 12, 14 hours. Um, you know, I'm sure that's all part of our circannual rhythms. You know, nature is trying to say, for goodness sakes, have a rest. Let your body rest and repair. Let the garden rest and repair, etc., etc. Um, so I do feel less productive in the winter. I try to keep going to about nine most nights, but recently, the last few, well, since since the new year, it's been my, remember I was mentioning little tweaks, um, little changes to make. I've said right at nine o'clock in the evening, whatever work I'm doing, whatever it is, um, oh, the light went out, from the, oh, we can still see. Um, yeah, by nine o'clock in the evening, that's it. Stop working, stop whatever you're doing. It's now time to relax for the next couple of hours. Try to get to bed by 11, because uh, I am such a night owl. I, I quite happily go to bed at two, three in the morning, but that's not productive. So yes, I've been trying to do that. And because of that, um, I'm finding that by sort of 10 o'clock in the evening, go to bed with a book, read for a couple of hours, read about, I try and turn the light off at midnight. There's been a couple of one o'clock turn offs, but it does mean I'm finding time to read and that's delicious. So the last little run of books, They're all, um, I think, Alaska, I think Yukon Territory up in the high north of Canada. They're all that kind of frontier, not frontier, sort of subsistence living, wilderness, off-grid type books. So I started with, oh my goodness, this is going to be a long one. I'm going to show you the books to another day. 
No, I tell you what, we'll plough on because the folk that like the long chatty ones, they can stay tuned. And if other folk don't like the long chatty ones, you can go now if you don't care about books because I'll just chat about the books now. Right, so first one is called Kings of the Yukon by Adam Weymouth. This came out in 2018. So it's quite a current book for me, unusually. Picked up at the charity shop, of course. Subtitle, An Alaskan River Journey. So the basic premise of it is this young chap, there he is, lives in London, lives on a barge in London. He wanted to follow the route of the salmon on the Yukon. So the journey starts with him right at the headwaters. It's actually not the Yukon, it's one of the ones that feeds into it, but he starts right 2,000 miles up river. It's hard to imagine a river 2,000 miles long, isn't it, for us in the UK? <clears throat> so his journey, he starts there, and his journey ends up with him at the mouth of the river. That's putting it very simply. <coughs> um, I don't want to get <clears throat> political uh, about anything at all, because it's for everyone to make up their own minds. But there is, there's not, it's not politics with a capital P, it's politics with a small p. This is definitely a book which at times is quite challenging to read. It challenges our own, um, you know, thoughts or our own kind of lazy habits or lazy thinking habits. It touches on all sorts of of issues of sustainability, climate change, um, needs in terms of settlers and and making money, needs in terms of native peoples and their subsistence living. So it is quite challenging from that point of view. I made a few notes because I don't want to forget. So I did find it a really, it's a really beautiful book, exquisitely written. Unbelievably, it's his first book. How can someone write such an exquisite book the first time round? Amazing. He's so eloquent. It's incredibly thought provoking without, you know, he's not ramming anything down our throats. He, he doesn't ever kind of put his agenda out there. It's all observation. It's, you know, this is a fact we can observe. What do we do with it? So yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. And, and I suppose in a nutshell, the whole book is about the sort of, the interface between say, the natural world and, and humans that kind of interface. And there's definitely the feeling throughout of, this is us settlers, Westerners, however you want to call us and nature. And this is native populations and, and nature and, and how they are so, so finely enmeshed and both sort of supporting and nurturing each other as opposed to that um yeah really i highly 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 recommend it it's a it's a beautiful travel story obviously as he's he canoes kayaks down the down the river he meets all sorts of amazing people along the way both both native peoples and settlers all sorts about sort of fishing techniques uh it, it yeah it is it's gorgeous. Those people he meets, oh, I want to meet them too. I want to spend hours talking to them. I, it, I don't eat fish, but put it this way, by the end of the book, if I ate fish, I'll tell you one thing, I wouldn't be eating farmed fish and I wouldn't be eating fish caught in the Yukon. It seemed, it just seemed bonkers to me and I checked this out a couple of days after finishing it going to one of my local supermarkets yeah I can buy a fish caught in the Yukon it just seems mad it just seems mad to me that we're so 
we're so far removed from our food now that that we will take these fish out of the Yukon and have them over here. Leave them in the Yukon for the people who live on the Yukon. I don't know, maybe I'm... It's a difficult subject, isn't it? It's a big, big, massive subject. It's a can of worms that I think I don't want to open, <clears throat> but yeah, definitely check it out. Now, what's weird in this, one of the people he meets is the star of my next book. This is one of the books I had for Christmas from Nikki, thank you. And it was weird because when I opened the parcel and I saw Stan Zuri, I was thinking, I know that name for some reason, I know that name. It didn't click straight away and I put the book in my pile of next books to read. And then I went to pick it up again I thought, I know that name. Why do I know the name? So I Googled it. Of course I know his name. I know his name. This is another nerdy thing of me. I know his name because it's in the list of, if you go into the historical lists of the Iditarod, which is the big dog sled race in Alaska each year, they start in Anchorage and go all the way over to Nome. I've mentioned it before and it's a sort of, it's to honour the serum run from the 1920s. But yes, he, he, he won Rookie of the Year in, oh, I can't remember now, 83, 84? Something like that. So that's where I knew his name from. So, Adam, when he's canoeing down the Yukon, meets Stan. <laughs> so, this is an interesting one. It's, it's written by someone else. It's a biography rather than autobiography, which I'm not normally a fan of. I prefer to read that person's account of their life. I, it looks like it looks like a print on demand and I thought at first oh no is it what we used to call vanity publishing you know where the book is so rubbish no publisher will publish it so you publish it yourself I thought, Ooh. and I was reading the first few pages and it was a bit sort of and then he did this and then he did that you know rather like when we go back to school after the summer holidays we have to write an essay what I did in my summer I went to the seaside and then I saw my nan and granddad and then we went to the castle. I was thinking, oh gosh. But uh, it picks up and I got into it. It's a bit listy at the beginning because it's sort of setting the premise. And so this guy, Stan, in his very early 20s, was getting into a lot of trouble. Was it Chicago or Boston? Boston he was living in. Getting into trouble with gangs and stuff uh, and a happy accident well he sort of made the decision that's it I'm going to go off and live in the wilderness so he ends up he ends up in Alaska of course um, on the Tanana was it the Tanana River I can't remember exactly well he doesn't live exactly anywhere he lives miles from anywhere but it's all about how he sort of, and he meets a lass and she wants to have a similar experience so they hook up. I don't mean as a boyfriend and girlfriend initially, but they just, they say, right, okay, let's do it together. So it's like, yeah, get the cabin built. What are we gonna eat? How are we gonna eat, et cetera, et cetera. So it was right up my street. And then towards the, the section towards the end goes into his experience on his first Iditarod. So all along he's had a few dogs and where he lives. You see, this is another interesting one, isn't it? Coming back to, to this one, this idea of, you know, the subsistence life and how much, I really want to talk about this more at some point one day. He, he has a team of dogs so that when he has to go to the nearest town to get anything, sacks and sacks of flour, rice, what have you, he brings it all back with his dogs. I'm just going to warn you, there is a chapter in here which is quite hard. It is really, really hard. Um, I, I, I love this kind of reading and, you know, when I was a kid, yeah, I probably did have a very romantic, rose-tinted view of this world but I can assure you I do not as an adult I don't eat meat 
that's because I'm able to live perfectly well without it in my climate here. If I was living up in this kind of territory, yeah, I would eat meat, of course I would. I would have to eat meat to survive. And to eat meat to survive would mean I would have to kill. I would do that. I, am, I have absolutely no squeamishness about that. If we honour that animal with, with respect, if we use that whole animal, if that animal is, is free and happy until that point, I don't have, oh, look, that's a whole nother can of worms, isn't it? Oh my goodness, this is my can of worms video. Maybe I should just call it can of worms. But yeah, if you are at all squeamish about, about anything like that, don't read it. But yeah, um, so I got a bit lost then, didn't I? Yeah, so back to this kind of subsistence and off-gridding and, and, I I really have to talk about this, expand on this in another video, but let's just say, if you've got a snow machine, uh, you need gasoline for it, spare parts, etc, etc, etc. That isn't entirely off-grid living, that's all I'll say, because you are relying on someone else for gasoline, for parts, etc, etc. With his team of dogs, he can be off-grid because he can fish for the dog's food etc. He isn't, he isn't entirely off-grid either. He is still reliant on other people and other things. This is something I, I talked about briefly in a video ages ago when I was saying I'm not self-sufficient and when people say they're self-sufficient I always take it with a massive pinch of salt because unless you are cutting down the trees that you build your home from, unless you are skinning animals and making your own clothes from them unless you are growing all your own food or trapping shooting whatever all your own food but if you're shooting it you're not entirely self-sufficient because you've needed to buy a gun and bullets you see so it's always that kind of degrees so i am not self-sufficient not by a long chalk i'm self-reliant that's what I like to say, and I am subsistence, but I'm not self-sufficient. Anyway, so you can see these, the, I love these books. They're thought-provoking. They make me question what I do and how I live over and over and over again. And that might seem weird because we're worlds apart. You know, they're in the frozen north. Here am I, you know, in the comfort of a big, safe city. Yeah, I'm definitely going to talk about this. Um, more in a separate video about these kind of parallels with my subsistence life in London and a subsistence life in Alaska, which I know it sounds completely nuts. Bear with me, I will talk about that another day. Anyway, so I finished reading Stan. It was great. It was a real page turner. That was one of those that I ended up staying up to one o'clock in the morning to finish. Nikki, thank you so much. Loved it. Then another quick read, and this one came from Antoinette. I keep my little notes inside of, of who books have come from. I talked about this probably a year ago, but finally I read it. This one, all oh, camera can't focus, sorry camera. Two old women, and now I've, hang on. <laughs> camera, find my face. Can we get a focus again? Anyway, two old I can see myself now that that's really massively out of focus. <laughs> it's not even, there's plenty of like, anyway. Two Old Women, written by Valma Wallace, who is, um, I think the, the, the story with this story is it's a bit of an old story, a bit of a legend story. It's been handed down through the generations so, I can't remember where Velma lives. Actually, if I remember rightly, it's it's pretty near, there was a map, I'm gonna see if I can find it. It was pretty near where Stan is. No, it's not near where Stan is, I beg your pardon. But it's, it's uh, another, it's very near, it's near the Yukon, so it's another one that's, that Adam went through. I think it's based near, Dawson City, I think. Of course, Dawson City wasn't called Dawson City then. Um, 
it's really lovely. It's, it's, it's a bit of a sort of a moral, a fable, if you like. I won't go into too many details in case you want to read it, but two very, very elderly, well, in that situation, in, in a freezing situation, old, uh, their tribe say, we've got no choice but to leave you behind. We're all starving, we need to move, we need to find new hunting, you're slowing us down, so we're going to leave you. Basically, they are leaving them to die. Bear with me, I know it sounds grim. Um, so these two old ladies, they're in shock and miserable and, well, there we go, we've been consigned to death. Of course they don't die, what do they do? They say, you know what? We're going to go old school, we're going to use the, the, the skills we have, we're going to survive, we're going to make it, and um, yeah, I'm not going to give the ending away, but we follow them on their journey over the course of a year, how they survive, and in the end how they thrive, and in the end how the tribe that abandoned them finds them again when they when they come back into sort of summer grounds for different kind of hunting, gathering, find the two old ladies thriving and actually the two old ladies end up giving the tribe food. I loved it, I loved it. It's like, yes, us oldies. I mean, I'm not as old as the, as the women in, in the book, but it was one of those things of, yes, we will prevail. We have skills, you know. Yeah, we may be slower and our joints may be creaky, but we have knowledge, we have skills, we have stuff to contribute. I think that's so true throughout any society, isn't it? Our elders, oh, let's tap our elders for their knowledge. They know stuff. They teach us to knit and sew, apart from anything else. Love it. And then finally, Esther, ah, ages, ages, sorry. Um, and I've lost my note from who it came from. This was sent to me, I think, a couple of years ago. I've been sat on the shelf. I knew I'd get round to it. And I knew I just needed the right run of books to read it in. And I know a lot of my American viewers know this book. We've talked about it briefly before. This is Louise Dickinson Rich's book, We Took to the Woods. This is a lovely edition, 1942. Love it. Map, so I can get my bearings. And it's absolutely full of, let me show you their cabins. It's full of photos. It's an uncut edge, the books. So you can't flick through it easily. I'll try it. Oh, I can't find the picture I want to show you. Sorry, I'm going to annoy myself. I'm going to try and talk and look for the pic. Oh, there it is. It's hiding. So there's their place. Deep in the woods. Now, this family are in Maine. They're right on the border with um, New Hampshire and I can't remember which bit of Canada they butt up to. Is it, is it Ontario? that they butt up to, or Alberta, no, Alberta's more in the middle, isn't it? Anyway, it's right, right tucked up there, so it's cold. It's sweet, it's very sweet, it's very charming, it's totally lacking in peril, the kind of peril that's in all of these books. It's, um, it's quite cosy, it's not off-grid living, it's not it's not really even subsistence living. She's making a living as a writer. You know, they can buy stuff. They buy, they buy all their food. I mean, they really do pretty much buy everything so far. I'm only about, well, I'm slightly over halfway. They may pick a bit of fruit from time to time. They may go fishing from time to time, but they are not subsistence living. Um, they buy. The, the, the similarity is the fact of of how cut off they are. So again, it's this thing of they have to be highly organised. If they're going to go shopping, you know, it's days away. You do a whole month, two, three, four months shopping even in one go. Get it back there um, in consideration of how will roads be, how will rivers be as we head into winter, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're into your wilderness 
sort of survival, subsistence, off-grid living type things, then yes, you love these. But if you want something a bit more gentle with a bit, a bit less peril, a bit less, um, let's say, the gruesome aspect of surviving, as in what you eat, then I think you might like this. It's really charming. It's interesting because it's 1942, I think it's 1942 this was published. Uh, yeah, 1942. It, the, the writing actually feels more modern than that. I don't think it's, it's not modern, like right now modern, but it definitely feels, it doesn't feel, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel arcane. It's funny in my mind as, I, as I'm reading it, I'm kind of, I've got pictures of Little House on the Prairie, the Waltons. So from that you'll get the idea of it's a much more mellow take on wilderness living. It's very sort of, it feels very happy and relaxed and, and lovely, and like I say, with no peril. So yeah, we took to the woods and apparently, I think there's at least one more that she wrote on on their lives there. So I'll certainly keep an eye out for that. But wow, goodness, this is a long one. I didn't mean it to be, I apologize. I don't apologize for that. That's how it happens. Some folk like the long chatty ones. So for those of you who like the long chatty ones, I hope you like this. Um, like I say, those the, the thing with these, Oh, it's always the way with me when I read. It, you know, so many more thoughts are born. One, one small book, myriad thoughts um, occur. And in a way, I could probably do a whole video on one book. Uh, I could probably do a whole series of videos on one book. There are some really, the, the like I say, the main thoughts they provoke. It's that sort of. I have been thinking the last couple of weeks about. Are there parallels in my life? You know, can I can I draw those? Are there are there are there things I can read about in these people's lives I can take and use in my own life? Absolutely. So I think it might be worth exploring that as a theme in another video, another day. Uh, but yeah, for today, that's it. I've banged on way long enough. I'm gagging for some water. Uh, it is quite chilly here, so despite the fact that I've got my gorgeous, all my knee woolly socks on, I think I need to put another pair on. Aren't they gorgeous? One final squeeze at the gorgeous socks. Brilliant. So I'm going to say cheerio for now. Uh, I'm not sure what you'll see next. Everything's a little bit upside down. There's tons to do in the garden, and I was thinking that actually most of the videos in February would be gardening videos because there's so much to get done out there. And as it's turning out, I don't know when the next one will be. Um, so when I see you next, it's it's probably going to be in the flat doing something. I'm not sure what. Oh, yeah, we'll do the budget. Subsistence budget. That's what we'll do for the next one. So until then, please look after yourselves. Stay in mischief, so long as it's good mischief. Stay warm. Stay cosy. I know there's a load of you who will have snow for months on end don't know how you manage. Yeah, stay productive, stay imaginative, be, be open, get, immerse yourself in your books, let your thoughts fly all over the place. Open hearts, open minds, brilliant. There's a whole world out there we can immerse ourselves in. So until then, huge amounts of love to you all, huge amounts of hugs and coziness. See you soon. Bye for now.